dire wave. Three. Our anthropology is not derived by human psychology or you know empirical data from MIT or something like this. It's derived from the revealed aspect of, of what we see in Christology. And so there's no real way to diagnose man's problem and to understand man and man's anthropology, as I said, without the, the right theology. Dire Wave 3.
yo, yo, what's up? <laughs> How y'all doing? <laughs> it's your boy Jay. Hope you're all having a wonderful whatever night of the week this is. I've had a great day. And I'm here as a faithful movie critic tonight. Uh, even though Jamie is not with me, Jamie doesn't feel that well. Nothing wrong. Seriously. She's she's not seriously wrong. She's a little wrong in the head. <laughs> she's not laughing. Well, I better ask my wife for permission. Well, she's the boss. <laughs> Boomer jokes. That y'all know Boomer Boomer Pastor jokes. Well, I'll have to ask my wife for permission to see what she says. Well, she's the boss. Angela, Samantha, Mona, who's the boss? People don't even know who Tony Danza is anymore. They're like, why does your email say Tony Danza? Because it's a joke. And it's not my fault you don't know who the boss is. Um, so, really enjoying my Gladio KGB Catholic Studies. And um, nearing finishing this, which means that also nearing finishing this. And those two go great together because now I have uh, come to the, it has come to a head in the contradiction chapter. That's not what we're talking about tonight, but I'm giving you a little update on the status of the next lecture, the part two for subscribers. We come up to the chapter on the character of Ali Agka. And was Ali Agka a CIA psyop to make John Paul's assassination into a martyrdom? Or was he a KGB asset to take out the Cold War symbol that was deconstructing the Soviet Empire? John Paul II and Lech Walesa and Solidarity. And both Williams and Kohler are interesting because they have two different accounts. Williams says this was a CIA psyop. Kohler says it was the KGB. And Marcus Wolf, the infamous Marcus Wolf, is who orchestrated the, CIA, the, the disinformation campaign that it was the CIA and that it was right wing uh, networks connected to Gladio that were training and arming. The Grey Wolves, a Turkish nationalist assassin organized crime unit, allegedly part of NATO. And so here we are with these two contradictory conclusions. And so now I'm thinking, all right, now, so how would we resolve this? Well, it turns out Daniel Ganser's book is his PhD. I think that's what it says at the beginning. I think it says, it's, I was looking for material for a PhD. So I assume he means this is his PhD thesis on NATO secret armies. So this would be very recent scholarship on the matter. And Ganser, as I can gather from the Turkish organized crime assassination intelligence chapter, backs up the CIA uh, guilt thesis. Now that's interesting because I don't really find this with the gray wolves to be hard to believe anymore because what did we just see today? Can you believe what are we even looking at? It's hard to believe this is what we're looking at. Let me make sure you guys can see this. So this automatically makes me think, not this chick. I don't know who we're looking at here. No, no, no. Let's go over here to the best profile on Twitter. And look at this. So this, here we are. Okay, this is a great meme right here. Making fun of it. Consuming. Because, yes, they actually tweeted this out. So let me go to the tweet that I shared. 
Yes, this is real. Hard to believe this is real, but here's where we are. Ukraine is hosting the great epic of this century. We are Harry Potter and William Wallace. Well, William Wallace fought against the British Empire. And degen, degen British kings. So you're literally the degenerate British kings side of things here as NATO. We're Harry Potter and Han Solo and the Na'vi blowing up the Death Star. Fighting Harkonnens and challenging Thanos. Okay, so the giant warfare and destruction in, in this area is equivalent is equated to uh, a bunch of garbage Western pop culture. So uh, do I believe anything that would come out of NATO? No, I think I'm going to side with uh, Ganser and Williams now that I'm seeing this. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, sorry, Kohler, I don't believe your thesis that NATO is the good guy in this scenario. I mean, you, and I had some of these NAFO troll uh, brigades. Have you seen these NAFO troll brigades? Gray Zone had a good uh, article on this. Uh, they retweeted me to call me out. And I went to the profile that was retweeting me. And of course, of course, it was, I kid you not, arguing that T-R-A-N-Z writes is what NATO is fighting for. And when they have the little stupid ass doge in their profile, that's that means they're part of these NAFO troll units on Twitter. So here you go. I thought it was satire too. I thought somebody was joking that that's what NATO was saying. No, no, this is the actual, <laughs> this is their actual profile. I mean, they've got actual bug men running all these things now. Here you go. Go see for yourself. Yeah, so the Doge, it's not nothing to do with Doge. They just picked some stupid meme image that they thought would be, that would tap into the Edgelord meme world and then you go to the profiles of the I kid you not and it's like we are fighting against those who would like to destroy T-R-A-N-Z and it's like could you imagine imagine your World War II Cold War boomer Cold Warriors, realizing that they're fighting for RuPaul, like literal RuPaul Empire, RuPaul Imperium, not Ron Paul, RuPaul. And uh, a large portion of clerics, too, are cited, as you can imagine, with this monstrosity and absurdity and the more that i re read about the galen network scorzani and all that no i don't i don't believe that i think all that stuff's true because here we have um here's some profiles championing the fact that nato is openly touting nazi imagine being so stupid as one of these people like this to think that this is something like you're actually winning the war and the culture war. I don't know why this won't work. Can you see that? 
It's not letting me move it. This thing's acting weird. There we go. So there's that goober who actually believes that in a the tiny mustache men soldiers are saving the day in this battle kid you not oh now my shit's all messed up I mean, it's just like the stupidity and the, the people falling for all these trolls and falling for all this stuff. It's hard to believe, but it is what it, it is what it is to use the boomer phrase. Why is this not moving? This is ridiculous. never happens until so I'm actually trying to stream and do something significant here this is this is always what we get so I guess I'll just turn that off yeah so uh, we're gonna talk about movies we're not here to talk about NATO but I just thought I'd give you a little a little taste of what the madness going on and does anybody even know what I'm talking about do you know what I'm talking about Galen Network and this kind of stuff it's just so sad that people are falling into some of these stupid little traps and nobody listens. Nobody. Why am I covering one eye? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's just get rid of these people. Goodbye, dude. This is crazy. This never does this until... Look at this. <laughs> what the heck is going on? Maybe I'm hacked or something. I don't know. But we're going to talk about... I'll just have to mute that out. Movies. Crazy cult movies that you've never seen. What are some of the crazy cult movies that you've never, ever, ever seen? That are obscure as heck that are still kind of fun to watch that are gritty that are edgy that tickle your fancy tickle you in your yoga pants well, i've got you a top 10 list for all you movie buffs out there all you movie fans and if you want to support the show you can do so via the super chat function right here you can leave me a super chat and we'll get to those here in a moment. Somebody said I have cheated them. I, I didn't read their super chat. And this guy's literally accusing me of it's a it's a con, a scam. You're a con man because you didn't read my super chat. Yeah, you really? That's what you think? So it can't be that I just missed your super chat. It has to be that even though I read everybody's super chat, it must be that I can't, I was, it's a con and I didn't want to read your super chat. People are just losing their minds. I think. And they don't know what to do, what to think. They're not grounded in anything and they're thus the susceptible to anything. And that's, I think the really sad part of where we are. A lot of people are going to believe really dumb, dangerous things. And that helps us, I think, to understand the importance of cult thinking, cult mentality, cult concepts. So we're going to be talking about insights from movies about cults, but not the cult movies that everybody's seen, that everybody's dissected a million times. 
We're not going to talk about eyes wide shut. We're not going to talk about Rosemary's baby. Rosemary baby daddy. That's today's version. Today's version would be Rosemary baby daddy. And the baby daddy is the devil. But at least the devil showed up. At least he won a delinquent daddy. Rosemary baby daddy. And I'm sorry that Jamie doesn't feel well. She can't be here tonight. If you would hit like and share. Let's start with our first top 10. We're going to start with 10. We don't usually break, do the like listing, you know, 10 to one tonight. We're going to do, it. it's going to be fun. We've never done a top 10 countdown type of type of movie analysis. So I had to organize these according to my preferences, my analysis. If you would hit like, and share, uh, let's get into the first one, which is number 10, which is why my least favorite of this list. And that is the 20, 21 film, not son, the other lamb. And the problem with the other lamb is that this is 100% obviously a feminist narrative, right? It's really transparent feminist narrative. And so it's the, the sad thing about horror is that horror as a genre is now being deconstructed and, and, feminized and I've noticed that you know really the last two years has been the big flip I mean there was already feminist horror themes right prior to the last two years but now it's it's turning it's just beginning like every movie is is about women who are victimized by evil patriarchal cracker men that's it right Yeah, I've seen Turbo Kid. It was good. Uh, I don't mean cult films as in like cult classics. I mean cults as in mind-controlled, crazy Jim Jones, Osho cult. I'm talking about cults. So the first film that is my worst on this list was The Other Land. And basically the reason this one's so bad is because... The, fig, the, the guy is supposed to be this sort of Jesus-ish figure. And he has, he looks like Christ. You know, he has obviously a lot of Jesus-ish elements. And so while I'm watching it, initially I'm thinking, okay, this could be interesting because a lot of cult leaders try to, try to emulate that look, right? Charles Manson has that look, right? Other cult leaders have tried to cultivate, you know, hippie Jesus look. So it does seem to work. It seems to, you know, somehow pass itself off as, you know, spiritual to Instagram yoga chicks, I guess, who, who would fall for this. And so at first I'm watching, I'm like, all right, this is okay. Um, and there's elements to where the cult leader in this film controls his flock, which are insightful for learning how to spot and, and see these uh, manipulation tactics, right? For example, he divides up his harem. So it's one dude. I'm thinking it's like a Mormon cult. It's, it's a very prairie muffinish cult, right? The chicks are all prairie muffin 1800s looking babes. And he divides them up in the blue team and the red team. <laughs> so sort of like shirts and skins, but with your harem. And we already at the beginning see, you know, quite a bit of, probably what would indicate satanic symbolism with the cult leader because he's eating with a giant ram's head above his uh his uh you know chair at the head of the table um he will not allow male children to be born so he and that's because he doesn't want to cede his kingdom to any other guy because he's a total narcissistic psychopathic cult leader and it reminded me of the cult leader that Chiller Queen did a good breakdown of. His name was Marcus Wesson, the Vampire King. And that was a really hard one to get into. Uh, go listen to her episode on the Vampire King. I mean, that that was crazy. And that was a Seventh-day Adventist cult split off. Seventh-day Adventists, by the way, if you don't know, they, they spawn a lot of cults. 
And this figure in this movie reminded me of that dude, except Marcus Weston, the Vampire King, looked like a giant, a mix of Ving Rhames and Bob Marley, basically, as a cult leader. Uh, which the dude in this looks nothing like that. But the same kind of vibe with that dude. So if you want more on that weird, crazy SDA cult, which was a vampire uh, I-N-C-E-S-T cult. Uh, yeah. So this cult is very into blood rituals and they have a blood anointing ritual and all this kind of stuff. And we, we know that obviously with the title, the lamb, right? The, the, the Paschal lamb, Passover lamb. All of that is obviously the theme here. And he's very perceptive and, and, and calculated, I guess you could say, in terms of controlling his harem. But we start to notice that the key figure, the main chick, the main girl, she is already beginning to have this little bit of a rebellious streak in her. And she doesn't trust this dude. And she has these kind of visions of... She looks like a, like a female... Harry Potter, basically, in the face. Female Dan Radcliffe. Okay, so we got a Mormon vibe going on. I don't know what that is. That's some weird hippie iconography right there. I mean, if you're drawing chalk icons on a tree, that's hippie. So here you are. You can see here's your cult leader dude with his harem. Blue team, red team, shirt skins. And the ram's head behind him, right? The goat's head behind him. I think we're already getting uh, intimations as to what's coming because he ends up himself being the sacrifice. So you think, oh, the sacrificial lamb is going to be the male children that he does not allow to live. But spoiler alert, this dude is the actual sacrifice. If you didn't catch that or didn't catch on. Yes, that's what's going on. That is hippie iconography. Chalk Jesus on a tree? Come on, man. So, I'm not sure what the yarn... Th th there's a constant yarn thread element to this movie. I never figured out what... Maybe they just used it for aesthetic element to be creepy. You see all the yarn up in the in the ceiling, the rafters there? With this little Mormon cold. Doesn't she look like a little female Harry Potter? Look at that. That's... That's Danielle Radcliffe right there. That's Harriet Potter right there. See? <laughs> anyway. All this I, I don't get the yarn and the string part. I mean that one never I never got that. Uh so it is good in that it the tension builds, we figure out, oh, it's actually a Human sacrifice cult, kind of, because he won't let any male heirs live. There is obviously the ritual impurity stuff with, oh, well, she's had her woman time. And then she starts to realize and think, oh, I'm being I'm being held down because I'm a I'm a girl. This this patriarch man is holding me down. And she's had these dreams and these visions of. I guess what we say is like the goddess or something. So he decides because the police come, they've been called to hit on his compound, right? His cult compound. So he says, we're going to have to do this, uh, you know, Mormon Brigham Young style uh, march across the countryside to find safe haven. Sort of a Moses leading, you know, his crew, his people, his harem. I'm just saying it's evoking these images. I'm not saying he's Moses, obviously. But... Uh, it reminded me of a kind of a Warren Jeffs. If you remember the story of the fundamentalist Latter-day Saint church, remember when Warren Jeffs set up his kind of harem compound, uh, probably, probably based partly on that kind of a thing. We get the F Exodus motif and then he decides he's going to put the, the fear into some of his ladies, his harem, especially the Danielle Radcliffe, Harry Potter looking chick because, baptizes her by halfway drowning her. And then she realizes, okay, this dude, and by the way, he's been, of course, uh, sleeping with all the chicks, obviously. So then she realizes, okay, he's going to kill me, so I'm just going to kill him. And so she leads a feminist goddess coup 
against her patriarchal oppressor cult leader man. Right? And then they become these wild dark goddess worshipping women in the forest. They turn into total pagan witch women. And that ties into a theme that we've seen recently with that we analyzed with the PSYOP cinema guys, right? Which was the dark goddess, the rise of the dark goddess. And what does that mean? Well, in my view, the dark goddess is just this archetypal image of the opposite to God the Father. Does that make sense? So, yeah, so this that... That one was, as a film, it wasn't bad. Like, it's well-made, well-crafted. It's, you know, but then it turns out to be this, oh, and by the way, uh, the patriarchy's evil, and if we just were wild goddess women, uh, we would be in tune with nature. I mean, come on, man. Yeah, I'm going to spoil the shitty movies. So you're like, why are you spoiling all the movies? Because this is the worst one. So. The Veil. So that was number 10. My least favorite in this this pile of obscure. Let's get to the next one. The Veil. Remember Jessica Alba? Jessica Alba. Remember her? Where's she been at? Well, Jamie says she's been out making billions of dollars with her products or something. Okay. Well, I guess that. That makes better money than independent horror movies. And this also had the lady from... I don't remember her name. What's that horrible TV show that everybody watched? American Horror Story. And so Jessica Alba and uh, the girl from American Horror Story... Jessica Alba is filming a documentary uh, to get to the backstory of this girl's lifetime in a terrible cult growing up in this very Jim Jones's cult. Now I love watching movies about cults, but if you make the dude just like Jim Morrison, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, or it's like, let's have Jim man, <laughs> Jim Manson, basically. Right. It's, it's Jim Jones, Jim Morrison, Charlie Manson, who's Jimmy, Jimmy Manson, basically. Jim Jacobs. Who's Jim Jacobs? That's our note. I don't know what... Oh, that's his name in the movie, I think. And so he's a revival-style tent preacher. And as I'm watching this, I'm thinking, okay, this is just like a regular old... typical cult movie. This gets crazier, though, right? And don't forget, old Jim Jones did have these connections to intelligence, CIA. There was a lot of crazy stuff going on. And so there's a lot of, it's, it's a little too Jim Jonesy here, right? And you think, oh, they're eating sugar cubes and they're going to tran in this story, they're transcending their body. So it's hearkening to heaven's gate as well. Right. And, uh, also the, uh, order of the solar temple. Remember we covered them. That was another, another one of these human uh, mass suicide cults. That one was a Crowleyan cult. This one. Surprised you because it actually has a explicit Gnostic Crowleyan reference. They actually talk about, which I couldn't believe. Let me see what exactly they noted. The, the veil that's split is the veil of the temple being rent. So whoever wrote this had a little bit of enough of a, of a theological education to understand the basic symbology of the, the temple veil being rent the veil of this life, the veil of the flesh, and that as a result of this sacrificing of their bodies, they would be ascended into the next realm and they would cross the void of Yaldabaoth and the seven archons known as the seven dark ones or legion, the, 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 those who rule this aeon. So in other words, it's a explicitly Gnostic reference, which kind of blew me away. And they, the cult leader says that Yaldabaoth created this world 
in this ritual of shedding the body, they will ascend to the next domain, the next dimension, and have power over this world of, of materiality. <laughs> and they do it via, spoiler alert, crucifying Jessica Alba. And so she ends up being the sacrificial victim. Uh, but it just got so crazy and Gnostic in terms of real Gnosticism and real... I, it just blew me. I did not expect that. So it's not a bad movie. It's a little formulaic in terms of the cut and paste, copy and paste of like every cult. And you got a lot of teal swan word salad going on by the cult leader. I like that part. Right? He's over there talking about, I feel that your energy vibes are not alchemically aligned with my fourth dimensional zone theory perception. Right? Which is all just a bunch of gibberish. And we do have uh, references to trauma-based mind control. We do have references to other uh, odd things like Edgar Casey astral projection. So there's elements of flatliners, elements of... <clears throat> Psychonaut, 60s, counterculture, holdovers via this cult leader. I mean, he's obviously supposed to be kind of a Charles Manson. Also, I'm getting Father Yod vibes. Remember the Father Yod documentary? If you've never seen that documentary, The Source Family Cult, I highly recommend it. It's a great cult documentary. It's it's a overlooked. Uh, but I get Father Yod vibes from this guy. Not this guy. This guy looks like a aged hobbit here. Um... Yeah, I'm not going to spoil too much, but there is a kind of a, a Stanford research uh, con mind control experiment going on in this movie. So you, you might think, well, why didn't you rate this one higher? Well, it, it doesn't have a good message at the end. That's the right. So basically, this goofy Gnostic cult ends up being the case, right? And the American Horror Story chick uh, is actually in on it. So, spoiler alert. So, I think if it had a better, more, you know, positive, wholesome message, I might have enjoyed it better. But it just ended up being this kind of Gnostic propaganda movie. Next up was a film I didn't expect to find that entertaining. I don't know if it has a trailer, but is this maybe a trailer? So apparently this movie has three ma names. That's really odd. Christy, a.k.a. Satanic, a.k.a. Random. Uh, looks like maybe it's free on YouTube. Yeah. So if you want to watch this one, uh, it's just an entertaining, not a lot of symbolism, not a lot going on in this movie uh, in terms of deep esoteric stuff. But it does have this interesting theme of college girl uh, being hunted by a, an online secret S-N-U-F-F -F club cult thing, right? Which uh, mainstream media says doesn't exist. So The Guardian, right? None of that exists, even though there's movies about all this stuff, but it doesn't exist, according to mainstream media. But uh, although I am going to count it as a cult movie, because we do get the, the implicate, it's implied in the film, that they are picking girls on the basis of various names, right? Like her name was Christy, Christy, follower of God is what her name means. We get, we kind of get uh, echoes of the Arliss Perry case in terms of uh, Maury Terry's ultimate evil, right? I think they might've pulled from some of that. So here's the movie. If you want to watch it uh, on YouTube, it's free to watch. Um, and the cult basically when they abduct the, the, the girls from college or wherever they are, they, they'll pick a girl named Christy and then they'll go after any girl named Christy. And they film it because the people get off on the this thing, right? Uh, they point out there is no God. There are no laws. And we kill the innocent. And... It's... 
basically a satanic movie with not much cult stuff going on, it's pretty good. So I gave it actually better than The Veil, which I didn't expect. But again, not a lot of symbolism in it. Next up, this one was gross, uh, creepy, and kind of reeked of... It's very Rosemary's Baby, but done in a uh, modern kind of gritty independent style. And that is the 2021 film Sun, or 2022, uh, about a single mama who raises a boy. And she had to get out of a cult. So we know that she once again was raised in a cult. We get this, 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 they love this Rosemary's baby theme of like the mama, single mama raised in a crazy cult. Right. And she's, you know, had therapy or whatever to get over the trauma and she's, she's doing okay. Her life is better. Odd to see in her 10 year old kid's bedroom plan nine from outer space. Uh, I mean, I'm not trying to read too much into that. I just thought it was odd. You know, how many 10 year old kids, do you know, that are into Ed Wood movies. <laughs> I've never seen a 10 year old kid uh, who, who would have ever been into an Ed Wood movie. Um, it is famous for being the worst movie ever, but I, don't know, I just thought that was a little, a little odd, but we noticed that the symbol, this is interesting. Let's see if they show in the trailer, the symbol for the cult. <clears throat> and I think if you notice the symbol, you would have noticed right away what was going on, right? Um, you know, she comes home one night and all the cult is there around her son in the bed. And, you know, I actually would have liked it better if they kind of left some of the supernatural elements maybe out of it, like the door closing and the cult disappearing. I mean, that's, it would have just been better if it had been minimal supernatural and then the cult kind of engineering all this stuff, right? And so she's flashing back to this period when uh, she was in the cult and they lived out in the country and, and they were holding these birthday ceremonies for her son when her son, when, when she was, she was pregnant, when she, when she conceived the son. And the symbol you'll notice is interesting because it's a cross, but on top of the cross is the Masonic square and compass. Uh, so, and perhaps it's even an inverted cross, right? Cause we do have on the top, it's kind of like the extension of the cross goes all the way up. So that would make it an inverted cross, right? And then we have overlaid over it, the Masonic square and compass. So probably now, and, we, and I thought that when I first watched it and I'm, you know, I don't know where the film's going. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe it does go in that direction. And then we see all the cult, like, chilling in in uh, the in the buff, sky-clad, right? And then you're starting to think, oh, okay, this is a... And then we find out, this journalist here, right, who's studying about it, he says, hey, turns out your cult was a P-E-D-O cult. Oh, so it's a satanic P-E-D-O human sacrifice and I did not know where this movie went. I had no idea it was any of this. I just saw, okay, this is a weird, you know, horror movie, whatever. And then, obviously, the kid is possessed. Okay. Yeah, thank you for putting that in there, uh, Dangerfield. We did do a Rift Track style analysis of Plan 9 from Outer Space. I got to remind you guys, too. I have not forgotten about Rotor. I just got so busy with all this stuff going on that I haven't done Rotor's... Uh, yeah, uh, the, 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 so I was actually writing out my, my riffs and I got 20 minutes in and I got like 10 pages of it. And I'm like, you know what? There's no way I'm going to be able to do the live stream and then read and keep up with the riffs. It's going to be really difficult. So we may just have to do it straight up live stream and not, if I, if I follow with my notes, I'm going to have to pause it. So I can't figure out how the dudes at Rift Tracks do this. I mean, I know they've done it for 30 years. Maybe they're just so used to it. They can, their rhythm is just so spot on. But, and it's also easier, I think, with three guys, right? So you got three dudes riffing. 
but I can't figure out how they keep in sequence without having to pause the movie. So maybe they have teleprompters. They probably have teleprompters, which would make it easier. But doing it live is is doable. It's just a little bit more of a challenge. And but I think I can do it. I can pull it off. Um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But I, I haven't forgotten Road Tour. I just have to remember to do it. Uh, now that we got all this stuff done, and I'm almost done reading all this uh, KGB, Stasi, Vatican, NATO stuff. So. Um, yeah, so we're, 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 you know, we're noticing, okay, this is a straight up demon possessed devil boy. And, uh, yeah, it's even worse than that. Actually, he, he's fathered by the devil. So this is like a straight up, right? Here's the conjugal bed in the cult compound. So it's like Rosemary's baby 100%. Basically, it's just totally updated Rosemary's Baby. And what, what they do is, it's like the, the life of Rosemary's Baby, basically. And he has to eat humans. And the the interesting point of the narrative is, how much do you love your son? Do you love him enough to feed him pimps and hoes? <laughs> you think I'm joking. She actually, like, feeds a giant pimp to her son, which is bizarre. And you'll notice, you see, she draws it inverted there. So I do think it's an inverted cross. And so we get the Manson-esque writing in the blood on the wall. So she basically just capitulates to her son as Antichrist. And yeah, that's the the whole plot is like, okay, no, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to roll with it. Right, so I'm impregnated by Satan. My son is a completely demon possessed cannibal boy. Let's do it. I'm down. <laughs> let's, let's roll with it. Right? What am I gonna do? Kill him? I can't kill him. Um, pretty creepy movie. I mean, like, you know, when the devil shows up, uh, they actually film that scene very well. Uh, seems like probably what the devil might actually look like if he showed up. By the way, that's the pimp. Like there, she when she feeds him the pimp. <laughs> By the way, what do pimp meat? Do you think it's stringy? Do you think it is funky? Pimp meat is probably funky. It's probably got chlamydia. Who knows? It sounds gross though. So this movie is not for the faint of heart. I mean, it's it's, it's pretty gross. So, but, um, you know, you've got your straight up satanic mind control, human sacrifice, pedo cult. I mean, those things exist. So and it was not the movie I expected. I thought it was just going to be, you know, a creepy cult, uh, harassing a woman trying to get away. No, it's actually full on satanic ritual abuse. Rosemary's baby part two, Rosemary baby daddy. Who is the devil? Who is a better baby daddy than a lot of baby daddies? Oh, next up. This is a fun one because it's a 50s movie. And it's also probably free. I don't know if it's free on YouTube, maybe. Curse of the Demon. We had fun watching this one. Um... Not a lot of symbolism going on here. A little bit. A few interesting references. But probably one of the first overtly occultic Hollywood, uh, you know, satanic ritual movies. There's a few prior to this, I know. Uh, there's another one that we didn't do called The Seventh Victim, which is from the 40s. So there was a satanic cult movie from the 40s prior to this 1950s movie. But... There wasn't a lot of this in the 40s and 50s. You know what I mean? This was like a, a rare, obscure genre. And it's not a great movie, but it's an entertaining movie. And it's got these kind of cheesy, noir elements for that time period. Noir horror, that's its own kind of little genre. Uh, and I do have to admit that, you know, for the 1950s, a demonic entity coming out of a uh, 
smoking ball of fire is pretty cool. I kind of like that. Not a whole lot to say on it other than you have a professor. It's an interesting thesis, right? So you have this uh, rationality science man who wants to disprove a famous British occultist who openly runs a satanic cult. And uh, he calls himself Carswell. And so Professor, I forget what his name is, Professor uh, Rationality, Sam Harris. Like he wants to go and, and debunk this. Well, he gets there to debunk and his uh, one of his cohorts in academia ends up ritually killed by the demon cult. And then it <clears throat> he explains that at a meeting with a bunch of other uh, psychiatrists and so forth that are going to go debunk this guy that the professor, or not the professor, the cult leader thinks that he is invoking Baal, uh, Typhon, and Asmodeus as well. As, in other words, it's the same entity. Baal is supposed to be invoked as Typhon, as Asmodeus, as Moloch. So it's a human sacrifice deity once again. And, of course, the, the professors, ah, ha, ha, this is all easily disprovable. There's no such thing as magic and the occult. It doesn't exist. It's been debunked. But, of course, his life and his times get more and more trying and difficult. And, in fact, the, the uh, cult leader says, I have put a curse upon you. So he curses the professor. And things get worse and worse and worse for the professor and more and more... Uh, obscure occult phenomenon continue to occur with the professor. He starts having delusions. He starts passing out. He starts having all these issues. And the cult leader has said, my curse will take effect in a couple nights and you will die. And of course, long story short, I'm not going to spoil it from you, but, um, He has to essentially outwit the cult leader at his own game and use his spells and tricks against him. Very, very reminiscent of The Devil Rides Out with Christopher Lee. If you remember in Devil Rides Out, which was written by British intelligence handler and operative Dennis Wheatley, who wrote a series of occult novels, and based the character Mokata on Crowley, uh, Christopher Lee has to use magic and the magic circle to outwit um, the Crowley character in The Devil Rides Out. So kind of like a worse version of Devil Rides Out is what we get in Curse of the Demon, but still fun, still ahead of its time. And yet at the same time, kind of cheese ball. Right, in a good way. Now, this was a weird one. This was a weird movie. Genuinely weird movie. This comes in as number, I don't know, what are we on now? Five? Six or five? Somewhere in there. Six. 2020 independent horror film called Broil. And a lot of weird stuff going on in this one. So, first of all, uh, the premise is we get this elite family in Scotland, the Sinclair family. And they're said to be the richest family in existence. And if you're familiar with, you know, conspiracy lore and kind of the goofier, uh, you know, 2000s era conspiracy stuff going back to, you know, Dan Brown garbage, right? You get Rosalind Chapel and the St. Clair family, right? There's this idea that there's this secret Priory of Zion, which is all made up. Like the Priory of Zion stuff is all baloney. Uh, but it does appear that probably some of these elite families probably do have a kind of genetic uh, or generational, I should say, kind of esoteric, satanic ethos to them, right? That's probably true. For some of these powerful families, the the Rosalind Chapel and all this kind of stuff, right? And if you look at Rosalind Chapel, I mean, it clearly has no 
recognizable Christian imagery or architecture in it. So I wouldn't be surprised if it, you know, it wasn't at some point converted perhaps into some esoteric thing. Uh, remember all this? Remember in the 2000s? I mean, I was into the conspiracy stuff since the late, late 90s. So, you know, I heard about, I knew about uh, Roslyn Chapel. Let's see if we can find a little inside of it. And everybody always talks about how it has these, you know, weird Templar uh, architecture going on in it. Remember this? Let's see if we can get a look at this. I don't know whose video this is or if it'll, if it'll be that good or not, but let's take a look. I don't know why none of my my images won't move. It's like they're frozen. So I can't fix this. So let's see what's going on here. Um, yeah, everybody always talks about the weird faces. Okay, let's see the inside. Let's see if there actually aren't... Icon, uh, Christian iconographic images. Yeah, okay, come on, go inside. Yeah, we know it's plays a big role in Da Vinci Code. It was a Templar castle. I, we we know this. Okay, dude, come on. Okay, so interesting craft work there, but yeah, we don't see a lot of recognizable Christian stuff. We just kind of see these doughy men etched into the into the walls we get the gargoyles uh, but not much Christian stuff right and you know there's allegations that the Templars had by this time already kind of been uh, into Gnostic stuff and I, I think that's probably true I mean I don't really spend a whole lot of time on this the Templar stuff, but there's definitely some kind of something going on with the Templars and Gnosticism. I mean, even mainline historians that talk about the Templars talk about that. And that's probably why a lot of the, uh, secret societies try to come up with these, uh, mysteries and parallels to the, to the Templars. Anyway, so that's the kind of the setting to this independent horror movie. Uh, and I'm not going to spoil this one for you because this one just goes crazy. And I, But I like movies that go crazy. So we're watching this elite uh, family, uh, Scottish family, and they are the St. Clair, the Sinclairs, St. Clairs. And we know that they have this, uh, they drink blood. So they're all sitting around this table drinking blood. They constantly need blood, blood transfusions. Okay, so there's some kind of vampire, demon vampire thing. Okay. Interesting. I'm, I'm into it. And one of the daughters, I think it's this chick, right? She can't, she thinks her family's evil. And so she wants to hire a hitman <laughs> to get rid of her dad because she's like, all right, my family is completely evil. Uh, nobody else is going to get rid of them. So I'm gonna have to get rid of them. So she finds a Spurg boy who beats up and kills people and sells drugs, but he's also a chef. And I, when I say that, I mean literally a, a spurt. He's a cataloger of sprouts as a chef. And the restaurant that he works for uses him as a hitman because the restaurant also sells drugs. So it's like the spurt. There he is, that guy. The Spurg chef, like the 18-year-old Spurg chef assassin. He's literally autism boy. This guy. Uh, and they're like, okay, you know, your, you know, your roots, your root working very well as a chef and as an assassin, can you kill my dad, the richest man in the world? Right. So it's just getting wackier and wackier. And the dad kind of catches on. He's like, oh, you're here. You're here to kill me, aren't you, boy? You're a good little spurg who's here to assassinate me. Well, I'll have it. Wait, now I'm doing, I'm doing Irish. Oi, lad. That's the Irish. The Irish. Scotland. The, the Highlands. The Highlander. The Highlander. They're here to kill me. They're here to, they're here to, they, I can't talk. They're here to kill him. Uh, he figures out the plot. And, 
I'm not going to spoil the movie because it's actually pretty good because we're getting into the top five now. But in the midst of all this, the uh, Spurg chef assassin tries to get a date with the uh, rich chick. So I won't just spoil it for you. But, but basically, uh, it ends up being a giant confrontation with the demonic entities from the demonic realm. And it's time to put an end to the cannibal families. So we'll put it. I'll put it. I'll leave it at that. A lot of fun. If you would uh, support the show via the super chat function, hit like and share, and I will love you more. Next up, this one uh, people had recognized recommended for a long time, and we never got around to it. Not on purpose, just because for some reason I just didn't get around to it. Uh, so this is number four, I think. Really well made. <clears throat> independent horror movie about a cult that kind of ticks all the box boxes of, you know, the classic Manson hippie commune type of cult. Right. Uh, but this is, I think Elizabeth Olsen's breakout role where she, uh, you know, first kind of made a name in the 20. So it's 11 year old film basically. Uh, but it's really good, right? So now we're getting into the actually pretty good movies. The other ones are all right, but. The Little Paper. The Little Paper. The Psychopath. The Psychopaths. The Little People are Psychopaths. They're here to kill us all. Now, I do have to talk about the ending of this movie because I want to give you my thesis, which I think I'm right. Uh, but Jamie and I, we kind of had a little bit of a debate on this one. So we got some, you know, commune loving, share, uh, uh, share brother. Uh, but she tries to run away. But she's still connected to the cult because she's so brainwashed and she's been, actually been drugged, right? She, she can't get away because it turns out they are R-A-P-E and drugging people in the cult. And the film kind of flashes back and forth between her present day situation where she tries to run away and go to her sister's house to when she joined the cult. So it's flashing back and forth. That part's it's the story's told really well. And, uh, when she flashes back, we realize that she's just this kind of innocent, naive, you know, teenage free thinking girl but she's a little naive about sexuality. We get, I think we get the impression she's a virgin. And then the cult leader guy uh, drugs her and gives, as Osho would say, his special seeds. He plants his special seeds. And this really bonds her to him and to the cult. Right. So we have the trauma-based, trauma bonding, trauma-based mind control and trauma bonding with the drugs, obviously. And so when she flees, she's almost going to get away at the very beginning. And, oh, no, she can't. So she tells her sister, uh, help me, but I have to go back. But I want to come to you, but also I don't. And so please help me out. And so here you have the rational, you know, sister with the normie, you know, broker, business brokerage man or whatever he does. And the weird part about this movie is that we actually can't tell which situation, which living situation is worse. So I thought that was actually interesting. Not that I'm pro cult, but there is this interesting dynamic where when she comes out of her commune, mind control, brainwash years of living at the cult to living with her sister who lives in this very normie PC, it's like, Oh, wait a minute. This is another cult, right? Because she starts critiquing her sister and the husband about their consumerism. Consuming, right? And she's like, well, I've been living on a commune and everything was pretty easy and we got along pretty good. I mean, except for the cult leader, R-A-P-E-I-N-G, R-A-P-I-N-G me and drugging me <laughs> like everything else is pretty sweet. Um, but wait a minute. Turns out the haven that she's run to is almost as bad or worse 
because we find out that hubby man there is also manipulative in his own way. And even though he's not a cult leader, like, is that, what's that dude's name? Is that DJ Qualls? I get all these, I get all these, uh, DJ Qualls, Steve Buscemi, uh, skinny, ratty looking dudes mixed up. <laughs> it's like, they're all, kind of, they all blend in my head into the same. Martha, Mar- what's that? What's this dude's name? I'm not trying to insult this dude. If he happens to be a, a listener, I don't know. He's probably not. Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene. What is this dude's name? John Hawks. Okay. John Hawks, Steve Buscemi, DJ Qualls. They're all kind of the same little skinny dude. And they're always playing this kind of creepy, greasy dude, right? Uh, Life on the Commune. And then Life in <clears throat> Boomer, not Boomer, Gen X, Wall Street, whatever, lifestyle. <clears throat> Brokerage businessman. Business charts. Graphs. Sell the business. Do the charts. Make the income. So, <clears throat> the best part of the movie is the going back and forth. But we find out that as she's in the uh, normal, normie world, outside of her cult, she's actually having a harder time because she's gradually mentally breaking down and realizing that the male figures are all out to use her and exploit her. So this could be read in a kind of a feminist way, which is the main critique negative point that I have with this movie. It's like, once again, I mean, come on, there's plenty of chick cult leaders. Okay. Maybe not as many as men, but there are women guru cult leaders. There was one that they wrapped up in the Christmas tree. Remember that when she died. That crazy chick. Remember her? There's Teal Swan. There is... Actually, Osho's cult was run by Sheila. Tough titties. Remember Sheila? If you do not like this, this is tough titties for you. Osho was just pilled out, dude. He was on freaking benzos or whatever pills they took in the 1980s. I don't know what they took. But Sheila was the run running all that. Like she was, you know, doing the arms trafficking and all the high powered surveillance and drug running. <laughs> like Osho's just sitting over there, just like doped out of it. Right. He's just over there in his spacesuit on planet nine. But Sheila's over there running shit, telling off people on Donahue, tough titties. That's what she said. Tough titties. Literally, that's what she said. That's not my joke. That's what she said. That's what she said. Tough titties. Let's see if I can find that quote. That clip. Yeah, Glenn Shamlin. Joyce Meyer. Yeah, how many female cult leaders are there? No, it's all greasy, wife beater, skinny white dudes. That's it. That's the only cult leaders. Anyway. So, of course, Hubby hits on her and then <clears throat> knocks her down the stairs or something. She knocks him down the stairs and then lies about it. And then we find out it gets even crazier because the cult shows up. They find out where she is at her sister's and they are a uh, murder cult. They're not just, it's not just a harem, you know, getting laid cult. It's a, we bust in your house and we murder your ass kind of cult. So the, it just ramps up. You're like, oh, 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 this is even crazier. And so it's a great horror movie because the central character can never find a place of solace and rest. So she's always on the run and everywhere she goes, it's, it's, it's getting ramped up even worse. And the best scene, spoiler alert. I think is when we're at the big party at the Gen X wall street broker business house, people, upper class people, they throw a big party. Uh, They want to introduce her to some nice people. And she walks over and sees the bartender. Uh Oh, is a dude from the cult. (laughs) 
Right. I mean, isn't this the best part of cult movies and satanic cult movies is when, oh, you think you've gotten away and then, oh, it's the, your doctor is part of the cult. Oh, the bartender is part of the cult. They know where you are. So she freaks out as a meltdown. And we don't know if she's having a meltdown because it really was a person from the cult or she's just having these paranoid delusions. That's the best part of the movie. Now, Jamie and I had a debate about this because it's a little unclear, which is, again, part of the reason why it's a good movie, is that at the end, it's a little unclear when she's, they're taking her to, I think, to see the doctor, her sister and hubby, and somebody stops their car, presumably to kill them, and it presumably is the guy from the cult. So if you've seen the movie, do you agree that that's what we're supposed to think? Or are we intentionally not told and it's unclear? Or are we supposed to think that, no, she's just forever in paranoid delusion? It's got to be the cult, right? I mean, it, that's because it's a horror movie. It's a horror movie. It's a horror movie. Yeah, Race with the Devil is good. I love those whole town is in the cult type films. Yeah. I, I, I thought about putting race for the devil in here, but maybe we'll save that for like other B horror movies, <laughs> but it, it, that is a good one. It could have easily been on this list, <clears throat> but I need to know what you guys think, right? So if you've seen Martha, Marcy, May, May Marlene, isn't it clear? Don't you think it has to be the guy from the cult? Because, that it's a horror movie. It's not a horror movie if it's some random dude in the street that's holding up traffic. There's nothing that's not horrific. But if it's the freaking cult people stopping them in the street, that's horrific. Anyway, that's my logic. What do you guys think? Next up, number three. So that was four. I thought it was I thought we were everybody's about Winner's Bone. Winner's Bone is a great movie, but has nobody seen this movie? Or is the chat really behind? Come on, tell me what it up. What, what what do you guys think? Oh, she just needed to take her meds? Come on, dude. I think they do have that discussion, right? She needs to, she's going to get meds or whatever. It's gotta be the people from the cult stopping them in the street. It's it's gotta be. Did nobody else watch this? Guys, if you would hit like and share, we got three more. Top three unseen, obscure horror movies. Tyra Faison says, yes. Ralph says, never heard of it. Somebody says, I don't go to the movies. Okay. You don't have to go to the movies. Mr. Wonderful, never seen any of these movies. (laughs) So Maddie says, he was there, but the filmmaker wants you to have doubts. That's what I'm saying. But that's what I'm saying. I've never seen these movies. Well, I guess I'm successful in my thesis that these are obscure movies because <laughs> like only two people have seen it. I cannot watch horror movies alone. Okay. Well, these are more like psychological thrillers. These aren't like straight up horror. Now, Sun was a horror movie. Uh, Broil is kind of cheesy, but... These are more like psychological thrillers. Uh, it's not like straight up horror, real horror movies. You're not gonna you're not gonna be scared by watching Martha Marcy May Marlene. That's not a, it's not a scary movie. <clears throat> Number three. <clears throat> now a lot of people hate on this movie. A lot of people think it uh, it's garbage. I actually rewatching this movie. I genuinely think this is a creepy movie, and it has a great aesthetic to it that's unique I did play the game years ago and I would challenge you to go back and rewatch this movie and see if you don't think it actually is a good movie for all the haters of this movie this is my hot take I've seen Silent Hill many times over the years Uh, I'm not saying it has a good message it's kind of out there but I was actually impressed with so many more elements this time around that I, I've decided that Silent Hill is actually pretty wild, pretty good. 
And so in our top 10 occult, this is coming in at number three. And it's got Scene Bean. Sean Bond, Scene Bean. Jamie kept saying this for like a month. She was she kept saying, Scene Bean, Sean Bond. And I'm like, what are you saying? And I didn't realize that his name is a contradiction. Because if S-E-A-N is Sean, then B-E-A-N has to be Bond. And it took me like six months of Jamie, Jamie saying scene bean to realize that's a damn con- That's a lie right there. Sean Bean's freaking name is a lie. The immorality of Sean Bean's name contradicting himself. So it has to be scene bean because it's B E A N bean. It can't be Sean Bean. It's just literally impossible. It's the, uh, it's the, it's the Sean Bean fallacy. It's actual, actual logical fallacy. Look it up. It's called argumentum ad bean. The Sean Bean fallacy. So somebody said, what is Silent Hill? A movie that where Sean Bean actually lives. Yeah, we just watched the remake of Hitch- The Hitcher. Remember Hitcher with... Uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me. The 80s hitchhiker killer movie, The Hitcher, with which is a good movie. And I couldn't believe it. it I mean the remake is not great, but it was alright. But I think it's I think it's a freaking is it is a is it a Michael Bay? Am I right about that? Anyway, it's not on the list. It's just an honorable mention because it's not a cult movie. It has nothing to do with cults, but the old one's pretty good. You go back to the eighties, the 1986 with Rutger Hauer, the Hitcher, pretty good eighties thriller movie. If you like eighties movies and basically just uh, don't give Rutger Hauer uh, a ride, right? Like you see Rutger Hauer on the road. Don't give that dude a ride because you're in for, an onslaught of you're never going to get rid of him. You're never, Oh, that's uh Jennifer Jason Lee in it. I forgot she was in this anyway. So they remade this with scene bean in 2007. And I think it was Michael Bay. Is it Michael Bay? Every now and then Michael Bay can make a decent movie. They're not all terrible. No directed by Dave Myers. No, know who that is, but it says something like produced by, Maybe it's produced by Jeremy Bruck, Jerry Bruckheimer, or, or I don't know. Anyway, you do get a Michael Bay, like there's a lot of explosions. So, I mean, Michael Bay somewhere in this, even if you just consulted to like tell him to blow some more shit up. We, there's a, there's some Michael Bay in the background somewhere over there rigging up explosions. Um... So Silent Hill, yes, I played the game. And if I recall in the game, doesn't it mention like the Illuminati? I mean, it is like a satanic cult that runs the town. Okay, so we're in another one of those classic the cult runs the town situations, which is which is great. We love those. And the daughter here is having these dreams and visions sleepwalking and she's being drawn to this mysterious ghost town in West Virginia known as Silent Hill and so the mom is you know tired of this because she can't seem to heal to fix the daughter's uh you know sleepwalking fixation whatever so she decides to just take the daughter to Silent Hill one night to discover what these dreams and visions and and things are there's a car wreck and she wakes up, daughter gone, and she's in Silent Hill. And the aesthetic of it, the creatures, the entities, the ghouls, the goblins, the de- it's it's a pretty good portrayal of the demonic. And they make that very clear throughout the film. We have these uh, theological references even early on in the film. Uh, we have, for example, seeing Bean coming and finding the mom and the daughter. The daughter has chased the mom has chased the daughter out on a sleepwalking binge and she's about to walk off of a cliff. 
I don't know why you would live with a sleepwalking child right next to a cliff, but uh, the, you know, scene being comes out there and saves them and grabs them. And there's a giant cross in the background. So there's clearly this theological Christian imagery going on. And then we find bizarre references like first Corinthians six, two to three of all. I mean, this is not an, a typical, this is very odd that this verse, did it show it? I don't think it showed it in the trailer here. So when the mom and the daughter in this field, and then you don't see it here, but right next to this field, they show this church marquee. And it's First Corinthians 6, 3, 3. We will judge the angels. The saints will judge the world. Very bizarre, obscure text that most people don't even know about. Now, we've talked about this text many times, but odd to see it in Silent Hill. And it has to do with foreshadowing where the film is going with the cult in the film because the cult is this weird puritanical cult run by a woman which i like the fact that the crazy puritan cult is run by a woman and they're not exactly christian it's like a vague weird culty it's the, the cultiest kind of puritan christianity you could ever think of with a woman pastor Bazed, red pilled, right there, exposing these horrible women. There shouldn't, there, there's no such thing as a woman. By the way, there's no such thing as a woman pastor. Doesn't exist. So if you see it existing, easy indicator that that is not the true church. Not a thing. Doesn't exist. By the way, you like my? We got one of these chalk. You like my chalk? Uh, see that the chalk thing going here? We got a little bit. We got a little bit of, of meat growing here. A little bit of a Resident Evil experimentation going on. We're not basketballs yet, right? We're, we're like basically large grapefruits, okay? We're not basketballs, we're grapefruits. We're working with what we got, okay? And how do we get, how do we get that? If you, Maybe you got little golf balls. I don't know what you got. But if that's what you're working with, you need this right here. You need this, there we go, this chalk.com. And if you go to chalk.com, I can guarantee you, you will find the supplements. Let's see if this works. No, I didn't get my, my thing is not working right. I don't mean my wee wee. I'm talking about my thing. My camera is not working right. Chalk.com. Talking about Irish moss. See that right there? That's for ladies that want to fix their hormone issues. That will help you out. Action 2.0, boost those energy levels, baby. She legit, focus, mental clarity. Use the promo code J50 to get 50% off all of those products over at chalk.com. You want to try it out? Try the promo code J50, get 50% off. Give it a try. Give it a try. Okay, we're working with grapefruits now. We're working with grapefruits. Maybe one day it'll be basketballs. I don't know. I don't know. But the place we start is chalk.com. Chocolate, cacao, all those superfoods. Great for your smoothie routine in the morning. Well, who knows? Maybe you do smoothies at night. Maybe you wake up at three in the morning. You do a smoothie midnight smoothie ritual. You're in a smoothie cult. I don't know. Go get those superfoods and test it out with the promo code J50 to get 50% off. And then if you want, you can then just use the better promo code for the recurring subscriptions. Cause I know that when you get these recurring subscriptions, it's going to be because you love that product. You want it coming every month. You don't want to have to put in that information. J 60 life J six zero L I F E gives you 60% off all of those products on recurring subscriptions. J 60 life. And no, uh, it, you snorting coke over there. You keep rubbing your nose. No, it's because I have allergies. Can people not tell that I'm a freaking nerd? And unfortunately, Chad, even the Chad nerds, we get allergies. And now that the weather has warmed up, <clears throat> uh, Pollen Boy is on full attack. And if you didn't know, Pollen Boy is an actual American Indian deity. So he's some kind of demon that attacks me on a constant basis. <laughs> People don't, even, don't even, people don't even know what we're referencing over here. There you go. Pollen boy. Pollen boy. 
is this demon that constantly harasses me. I'll show it to you right here. Pollen boy. You thought I was making that up? No, that's a Native American thing. Yes, there's also dust in the library. It's all the above, bro. But also, this dude has aligned himself with quite a few trees that don't like me for whatever reason. I like trees. I've done shit to trees. For whatever reason, they've got it out for me. I don't know why. But if somebody knows the proper spell to make Pollen Boy stop attacking me, please cast that spell. That's a joke, dummies, before you try to expose me. That's called a joke. <laughs> but somebody has put a Pollen Boy spell on me. Probably one of these witches in Silent Hill. I don't know. But that's just part of being a Chad nerd. You, you, you get, you're going to have allergies, right? Nerds have allergies. Unfortunately, Chad nerds also have allergies. I don't know. I don't know. It's just part of it, man. That's part of it. <clears throat> so, back to Silent Hill. <clears throat> so, mom's on a quest now. And I didn't realize until I watched it this time through. This is a Catabasa story. Which is cool. That's neat. I didn't even realize that. This is a mama descends to the underworld to save her baby. Kind of. <laughs> right? Because um, not every element of this story is uh, orthodox, obviously. Right? We're going to get some weird stuff going on. But it's still an interesting Catabasis tale. And it's number three in, in tonight's list. <clears throat> and I don't know what's going on with you know, the woods in West Virginia and around here, you hear all these stories all the time. I don't do cryptid stuff. I do watch a lot of videos that talk about goofy things like, uh, shout out to my favorite, by the way, it's not chills anymore. Number three, I hope that these people find the cryptid that they're looking for. Burger King foot lettuce, right? We all know about chills. Well, I, I, I'm not, I have a new favorite. Sorry. It's not chills anymore. Chills started rapping. Uh, now I like Impossible Channel, James LaFleur. James is my favorite now when I want to watch Queepy. And James cracks me up because he's French Canadian. And so when he talks about weirdo, uh, weird unexplained videos, he says Queepy because he's French Canadian. So, so now unexplainable Queepy things. Uh, these are these are addictive, by the way. If you don't watch these, these, these videos are a blast. And I DM'd him. We've DM'd a few times. I can't get him to do an interview. He won't do an interview. Right? James LaFleur. I do recommend a regular dose of Queepy videos if you've not watched Queepy videos. And by the way, this is the way to grow your channel right here, dude. 1.2 million subscribers from Queepy videos. Channel with notifications on for more videos like this. Today we're going to be taking a look at creepy TikTok videos creepy. that will definitely give you the ch creepy. <laughs> Anyway, uh, how did I get to, oh, haints, boo daddies, and boo hags. <laughs> this is a real thing. So in the Appalachias, Appalachias, they have stories of whistling haints, boo hags, and boo daddies. That's real cryptid creatures out in the woods. Okay. So. I don't know what is going on. So I watched a lot of these videos and uh, this is not about that. I'm just the fact that the movie takes place in West Virginia. Jamie and I were talking about all the stories of, uh, you know, cryptids and entities in the forest or whatever, in terms of Appalachia and all that. And you, you hear these stories all the time of people uh, encountering weird sounds out in the middle of nowhere in the forest and weird phenomena. Yeah. You know, again, I, 
I have no idea if any of this is true. Just all these stories and you just wonder like, what is all this stuff? Like what, what is all this? Is it all people just making up stories? Are there real strange entities, uh, way deep out in the wastelands? I mean, who knows? Maybe, I don't know, but I just love the fact that they're called haints, boo hags, and boo daddies. This is just weird Southern people terms, dude. I don't know what else to tell you. It's what it is. Anyway, so this is definitely the domain of the portals where the haints, boo hags, and boo daddies come from, right? So she passes over to uh, Universe B, basically. And in Universe B, she doesn't realize she's in Universe B. Talking about Mama, Mama Chick here. And so she encounters uh, these weird entities and creatures in Silent Hill. And we find out that Silent Hill is actually, again, Universe B. But one thing that's neat is that in this hellscape, uh, there's night and day. Never thought about there being night and day in hell, but actually that's interesting. So there's different elements to hell, right? It's not all, you know, like fire and flames. There's like different layers and levels. And so it's, it's, it's kind of Dante-esque, right? In uh, Silent Hill, basically Silent Hill is like a portal, right? It's a ghost town. It's a portal to this other dimension. And it's a, a what do they call it, Buffy? It's a hell mouth. Okay. Seen being always mad in the hell mouth. We find out that there's a church, but it's not actually a church. This is pretty interesting. It's the cult that resides in the hellscape that has convinced themselves that the apocalypse came. But what really happened was that the church, the cult is a human sacrifice trauma mind control cult that cooks and eats kids as part of a town satanic cult and they burn themselves down years ago so that the cult doesn't realize they're dead but the cult believes this delusion that it was the end of the world and that they're still in the world and that they must purge beings by cooking them. It's just wild, right? It's crazy. So <laughs> the, the, the worst part of this is that even though it's not explicitly a Christian cult or, or group, it's a pseudo Christian cult group, which has burned a girl innocently Okay. The girl turns out to be preserved from the cult. They, they're going to try to cook. They cooked the mom. The mom survived. The mom had a daughter. The daughter was put up for adoption before the cult could kill her. She survived by the blonde mom in the movie adopting the girl. Son, Sheen, Son, Bon, she Seen B. Seen Bean and the chick adopted this girl, right? Uh, and of course, it turns out, yes, she's the daughter of the cult. Um, but she has an altar creature that's her shadow side, which is a demon in Silent Hill that was created when the girl was traumatized in the cult. And she empowers the girl, but then enters the mom so that the mom can enter into the church as possessed. And when she gets cut and her blood spills in the church, her tainted demon blood can then corrupt the church. This is crazy, right? So then out of the depths of hell comes the original mom who is again the dark goddess empowered by the demon to wreak revenge on the cult that cooks 
kids to purify them. And they also hint that this is a pedo human sacrifice cult because the janitor abused the girl. It turns out this is wild, like crazy, but they do explicitly mention that the alternate personality was created when the girl was traumatized when she was young. I mean, this is just, this is crazy. I mean, this, and by the way, they are remaking this game. So I'll there, I think there has to be like some, is this a Japanese game? Because there's definitely a Japanese horror ethos to this. Not that I care about Japanese horror at all, but um, it's a pretty good horror movie. I'll leave it at that. So I do recommend Silent Hill as number three. Number two, let's get through this. By the way, if you would hit like and share. Also, you can support the show via Super Jets. And I want to remind you guys to go on over to Grand Theft World. Because Richard Grove is a based, awesome, red-pilled, liberty-loving, rational male. He's a, just a freaking cool dude. And Richard's super smart. Uh, I mean, there's not a lot of people that I tune into to listen to to learn from. But Richard is one of those people that I actually learn things from. And I want you guys to support the people that support us. So head on over to Rockfin and subscribe to Grand Theft World, the best podcast out there when it comes to geopolitics next to what we do. I mean, I think, you know, we're on the same team here. So, you know, they're putting out stuff that's gold caliber, like what we put out. And again, they teach me stuff, right? They go into topics about intelligence operations in the 20th century history that that I don't know about. I learned new stuff listening to Tony and, and Richard. So subscribe to Grand Theft World. Good over on Rockfin. Yes, you can subscribe to uh, some of the trailers and you know little clips on on YouTube. But Grand Theft World is just a little too uh, hardcore for you know YouTube. But you can subscribe to Tragedy and Hope Richard on youtube if you want but really the good information the seven hour podcasts and breakdowns every week are over here at grand theft world on rockfin and reminder too that you know it's richard that had this great idea to create this new coursework right the philosophy course 30 plus hours of my philosophy course you can get the whole course right there in that link at the autonomy marketplace and you don't have to get the tutoring option. If you get the tutoring option, guys, the way it works to help everybody understand is March 9th, I think. Let me look at the calendar here. Yeah. So the next season starts up in two weeks. Is that right? Two weeks, March 9th. Yeah, March 9th. It'll be every Thursday. Okay, so Thursday, what we do is March 9th, that Thursday, you'll watch my full lecture and then I will be there for tutoring Q&A for as long as you guys want to talk. So that means when you sign up, you'll be involved over there on the autonomy marketplace and all that. You'll be in there in their inner University of Reason situation. And then I'll come into the, the room and answer everybody's questions Q&A for that first three-hour lecture on pre-Socratics. So we have Introduction of Philosophy and the Pre-Socratics. That's lecture one. Then we come back, right, next Thursday. And you watch the next course, which is Plato. Plato. Two-hour lecture on Plato. Then you do the Q&A with me. So it's each week. That's how it works. You don't have to do that if you just want to watch the full 12-lecture 30 ish hour course. You can just buy that if you want, you can do whatever you want. So, but both options are there. And if you do want that, get it over at the autonomy Agora marketplace, the philosophy course right there in the show description and linked right there. Also guys, remember that, uh, people have been say, where's the red book? Where's the red? The red book is a little back ordered. Okay. So it's not, I'm not, not giving you your orders. Okay, there's just a few orders are behind because most people are buying the red book, which is fine with me. 
because if you buy the red book, yeah, you get you get all the essays that are not as beautifully uh, uh, spaced and placed in this fine production. So it's true, you but but you also you know it's, it costs more. So anyway, they're gonna be here. They're just everything. You know, shit just doesn't work right. Supply chains stuff just just, just don't work right. I'm sorry, right? But it'll be here. You, you'll get your red books. I'm not trying to keep anybody's books. Next up, the Killing Fields. I don't know why I said that's not the Killing Fields. Uh, my next number two obscure cult movies that you haven't seen. I think Brett Easton Ellis did this. Or like he wrote it, I think. I think that's right. Is that right? Did he do the screenplay for this? Uh, of course, it doesn't say here. Yes. Mary Heron. <laughs> Let's see. Did he do? He did this, didn't he? Am I wrong? Maybe maybe I'm wrong. I thought he wrote the screenplay for this. Charlie. Uh, I guess I'm wrong. I don't know where I got that. So let's see who did do this. This is my not coming in at number two is Charlie says obscure uh, cult film that probably you didn't see written by some woman never heard of her. Okay. So I don't know where I got Brett Easton Ellis from. Uh, I think I was, Oh, I know what it is. I was, I just wrote his name on this cause I was watching another. Uh, he wrote the screenplay to the smiley face killer movie. Which was not a very good movie. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. That was kind of gross. I didn't care for it. But Charlie says, who would have ever thought Doctor Who could play your boy Charles Manson? You think I'm Doctor Who? You're Doctor Who. Doctor Who's on first? Who's on second? Yeah, God, I'm number one, number two in your mind. Doctor Who to you. Doctor Who has Charles Manson and he does it awesomely. Yes, Matt Smith does an amazing Charlie Manson. Who would have even thought? Now, the movie is told from the perspective of Patricia Krenwinkel and all these nasty Manson chick skanks, right? Which is an interesting angle. Tell the story from the perspective of these poor Manson skanks. And everything in this is pretty, I mean, as far as I know, fairly accurate, right? It's like, this is probably how things went down. Uh, it doesn't like go into really conspiratory. No, it is from, wait a minute. Writer and director. Okay. So not the writer of the book, the writer of the movie. Is that who this woman is? I don't understand. I'm confused. That's why I thought Brett Easton Ellis, because it said the writer of American Psycho. I'm like, isn't that Brett Easton Ellis? They mean the writer of the movie? What are they talking about? <laughs> Help me out. I'm, I, how am I? I'm confused on this, right? What is going on? So if he did American Psycho, then how is some other woman the writer of this? Is, is that a pen name? I don't even know. what the, What's going on? Confused. Somebody in the chat know? Where's Danger, Dangerfield Henley? Yeah, okay, so, but who's Mary Heron? I'm confused.
So, but I mean, everybody knows that American Psycho was written by Brett Easton Ellis. Is Mary Heron a, uh, a nom de plume? Jay's the only person to make me laugh like I'm on weed when I'm not on weed. That's a pretty damn good comp compliment. I like that. Oh, the director. Okay. So it's just some chick that's... Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. So I was right. <clears throat> so yeah. So Doctor Who actually plays a, an amazing Charlie Manson. Uh, who would have ever thought? And he sings and acts just like him. Gib gob gib gob, right? And <clears throat> what I liked about this movie was that <clears throat> the, the the hippie New Age stuff, right? Everybody thinks that hippie New Age stuff is like all about peace and love. But really what's going on in the hippie stuff is that, not not in terms of all the people, but there's this dark satanic background to the hippie stuff, which not many people know about. But when you get into the real roots of it with, Blavatsky and Theosophy and Crowley who were really all about that new age stuff way before the new age. Then you realize that, Oh, they were the ones that were pioneering the hallucinogens, the shamanic journeys, the, the, even the mind control stuff. Right. I think what Dr. Spence, we interviewed Dr. Spence and he theorized that, you know, Crowley's drug diaries might've actually been, influential in terms of Huxley and the idea for MKUltra. So Crowley might have been a proto MKUltra type of thing, right? And we know that Timothy Leary is where we get the 60s counterculture from. He was the one giving out all the LSD. So I like the fact that this does not present the hippie lifestyle as the peace, love, granola bar stuff that it's presented as. And we realize that, no, actually... Straight up Satanism is really what's going on. And it's Sadie, right? Yeah, Sadie. No, Susan Atkins was in the Church of Satan. So one of the Manson chicks actually was in the Church of Satan. Now, that's hinted at in the Tarantino Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But uh, that's actually the case. Uh, Linda Kasabian says, I was actually into witchcraft. I was a witch. They were called the Witches of Mendocino. Um, and then other ones in the others, the, the outer circle, they were called the Earth Mothers. Okay, so that's what's really going on. with The, the New Age stuff has this outer portico of the Earth Mothers and this inner core of the straight up, you know, the Satanic Witch, basically. Um, so that, that that's all accurately presented in the movie, which I appreciated. We do see when she gets there, uh, he's taking in, you know, all these strays, all the chicks, they play the, the roles perfectly. And he's like giving them straight up LSD and mind control. Them. Now they don't re mention MK ultra, but they do very, they make it very clear that basically he's mind controlling them all through straight up constant acid trips. And the story flashes forward to the girls when they're in the women's penitentiary and they're all still completely devoted to Charlie, right? It's just crazy. And I think they even have that scene. They did it really well. They shot it really well where... Have you guys ever seen this, the, the scene of um, when the Manson girls were going to court? And they're all singing songs to Charlie. Have you guys seen that? That's pretty crazy. Let's see if we can find that. Yeah, here it is. This is wild. And they do this in the movie pretty well. All around the world, <laughs> you gotta spread the word. Tell them what you've had. Gonna make it better day. All around the world. That's the Liam Gallagher version of the Manson Chicks song. 
Kumbaya. <laughs> Perfect. Right? Perfect. We're talking about some straight up thuggy Temple of Coom stuff. That's what we're talking about, right? All around the world. You gotta spread the word. Tell them what you've had. I'm gonna make a better day. And I know what I know. And I know what I know. It's gonna be okay. Na 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 na. Na 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 na. Na na na. Now we're gonna get some people mad about my. That's that's Liam Gallagher for you. Did he get that from the Manson girls? Is the love is the love is the love is the love is the love. Uh, we have no rules, we have no special signs. Whatever we feel at the moment to do, we understand each other. And each time it's different. Charlie spread his happiness. And they look at him and they say, he's a clever devil. I'm gonna spread some happiness to you right now! Cause I'm in your mind! It was mainly... Is that the only song they have? <laughs> the one, the one, he's the one, he's the one. See, here's another one. How are you this morning? Fine, how are you? Good, you happy? Oh, I'm so happy. You stand still a second right there, why? Yeah, that's very good. You gonna cop out here? Kill the Indian. She's dressed like Alice in Wonderland or like a Disney princess. I don't know. I've never seen this one. I've seen the other one, but they look like Disney princesses. That's really weird, dude. What in the world? Anyway, so yeah, they would just like dress up like this court day. Court day. Dress like a Disney princess. What? Court day. Talking about court day, it's got me singing that Pete Tosh song. And I'm wanted by the evil forces. Tomorrow is court day, and I might not go. Anyway. Uh, so back to Charlie says, yeah, so, um, this is all done just really, really well. Okay. I mean, this is perfectly done <clears throat> artistic portrayal. And this movie actually has a good message because I won't, sp I, well, we all know what happens to the Manson gang. I got, how can I spoil it? Right. But it basically tells the story from, um, is it Sadie's point of view, either Sadie or Susan, one of the two. And one of them becomes like, a, she, I think she became an evangelical in jail. So it, maybe it's told from her perspective, right? But um, there's a certain point where she's offered the opportunity to leave the Manson cult. And they shot it really well where she like, that she's at just this fundamental juncture in her life where it's like, you have this opportunity right now to get out of this. And you think at first she's chosen it course she hasn't but it kind of gives you this alternate version of what would happen if she had if she had left the cult but um yeah really well done movie it's called charlie says highly recommend it it's number two let's see if there's anything else in my notes that i didn't get to uh brian wilson showed up that was pretty wild and if you remember brian wilson is supposed to be mpd did right there is a movie where John Cusack plays uh, Brian Wilson, and it actually has the him being MPD DID with like multiples and alters. Pretty crazy. Um, I like the way they brought in the apocalypse in time stuff, uh, because Charlie's cult was, of course, this weird mix of hippie philosophy, racial philosophy. Uh, process Church of the Final Judgment, um, 
a lot of people don't know that uh, Charlie had achieved the theta clear level in Scientology when he was in jail. A lot of people don't know that, which I was talking about that 10 years ago because I read a giant book on it. But that I think all that has now come out with the Tom O'Neill book, Chaos, right? Um, so I don't know if the people that made this movie read Chaos, but maybe Brett Easton Ellis did. Let's see if there's anything else I missed. Revolution number nine, number nine, number nine. Oh, there is no death. So I guess Charlie, there ain't no death, man. Death's in your mind. I'm death. I'm also life. You're death. You're life. Right. I, so they have this section where he, yeah, there's this, I remember now there's a section where he reads, it's like Charlie's exegesis, Right. And of course he would read the book of Revelation, right? There's no other cults love the book of Revelation. That's the only thing they they care about. It's the only thing they read. And he does this, uh, you know, process church, Robert de Grimston type analysis where Jesus is Satan. Satan is Jesus. They're flip sides of the same coin. And Jesus is bringing the apocalypse and he's doing it like through Charlie and his cult, of course. Right. And, there is no death. So there's these weird Gnostic elements. The death's an illusion. It's, it's uh, which by the way, I think Teal Swan, does she say the same thing? Um, oh, and then he, uh, they, they actually believe that he had invisibility powers. I remember reading that a long time ago and it comes up in the movie because there's a therapist who tries to work with the girls and she's like, she thinks she's making progress, but then the girls always, they, they never stop believing Manson theology. <laughs> it's like, she'll make this progress. And then the girls will be like, yeah, it's like when Charlie could, uh, disappear. Like Charlie would like disappear or whatever. And we just never could figure out how he was able to make himself be invisible. Um, and we always asked Charlie to make us invisible. It's like, he wasn't invisible. <laughs> it's like mystery men <laughs> Remember the black dude in, uh, in mystery man. Who's like, my superpower is I can be invisible when nobody's looking. <laughs> right. So Charlie says, great cult movie. Number two on the list. Everybody said, I've never seen these movies. That's why it's obscure movies. You've never seen. So operation obscure movie was a success. There you go. All right, what's our last one? Well, probably a lot of people have seen this one because this one was kind of a hit. It uh, wasn't a theatrical hit, but it was an online hit, I think, through Netflix. And this is our number one of the night, obscure cult movie, and it is called The Invitation. And I don't mean uh, the black chick running from the vampires. I'm talking about the 2016 Liam Hemsworth, The Invitation. Nobody was expecting the twist at the end of this movie, were they? No, you weren't. Now, have y'all seen this one? Probably a lot of y'all have seen this, right? If not, there's the trailer. I will destroy. I will uh, spoil. Despoil. I will spoil the plot because there's a huge twist. Which, if you've not seen the movie, I would say don't listen to the end of this analysis because it'll spoil it. And it is a good enough movie that you don't want to spoil it. So, this is number one. Uh, And it begins with this invitation to a dinner party up in the hills of L.A. Prime cult real estate. You can't have a cult and not be in L.A., dude. Or California in general. You got to be in California. That's like cult breeding ground. That's like a festering fetid pool. It's the primordial soup of cults is California, dude. So we check that box. Got it. We're also up in the hills. Up in Topanga Canyon. Up in Wonderland Avenue. 
up in the Hollywood Hills with all the crazy loons, the Hollywood crazies. Box checked. And what do we have? Invitation to a party. It's a party at your... Don't go to your ex's party, dude. Why are you bringing your new girlfriend to your ex's party? That's mistake number one. And I think his new girlfriend didn't want to go, right? And it's like, well, we're going to be all be friends and be cool. Don't just don't even go. Don't you don't introduce your new girlfriend to your 10 year live in ex or whatever. But of course, he's made this mistake and he shows up to the dinner party and everybody seems overly giddy and happy. And they did a good cross section of, you know, L.A. Hollywood weirdo type people, right, to be chilling, hanging out. And we know that part of the reason that the uh, woman there in white and our main guy have split up was over the fact that they lost a child. So they had a child together. The child was lost for some reason in some accident or something. And now this has, of course, led to their split. They're with new people, but they feel like let's all hang out. We used to be friends. Maybe let's let's reunite. And then this weird boomer shows up, right? This guy, you, you've seen this guy in a million movies, right? The, he looks like Todd Packer. It's like, wait a minute. If weird boomers start showing up, uh, uh-uh. this is not a party I want to be at. So we got a bunch of millennials and gen Xers. And then we got this weird boomer dude showing up and the weird boomer dude immediately brings weird boomer vibes. Right. And he starts acting a fool, acting weird, acting strange. And, Great creeping tension in this movie. This is an excellent movie. A couple weird things that uh, pop up right at the beginning before they got to this weird house where they used to hang out. They hit a wolf or a dog or something like some kind of weird creature. This is an omen, right? Maybe it's a coyote, I think. And uh, the main dude has to kill the coyote because he's not fully dead from the car wreck. So this is, uh, you know, setting the stage. This is, uh oh, we got, we got death coming. We get to the party. Everything, everybody's acting weird. It's getting weirder and weirder. And our main character here is really put off by all these people. He's had enough of it. He's had some kind of a break, right? Um, He's had to heal from the loss of his son. And the great part about the psychological dilemma that he's in is that we don't know, kind of like with Marthy, Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene, we don't know if the people at the party are really into something creepy and weird or if it's our main character who is misinterpreting events, social cues, and taboos and idiosyncrasies and whatever, right? We don't know. We don't know if it's his misunderstanding. And we are there with that guy going through this process and we're constantly thrown off. That's the best part of this movie is that we keep thinking, oh, wait, he, it's me, right? As the main character, we're this main character. Oh, we're making the mistake. We're the one that's misinterpreting everybody's kindness. But it does start getting weirder. We do have this introduction of the cult leader guy who is the perfect sort of new agey guru guy. And they did this right. They did it better than in The Veil. The Veil was too overt with their Jim Jones, Charles Manson guy. He was too over the top. And this is a little more subtle because it's like, I don't know, Professor Dr. Dr. Bob something, right? And, And he's like got this meditation group that helps you meditate past death, right? It's a lot more believable. People would fall for that a lot easier than some dude that looks like And so Dr. Bob's meditation cult, whatever his name is, right? They make him watch this video and Dr. Bob is basically cult coaching somebody into death. And he has this uh, line, you know, so it's, it's again, it's a kind of a teal swanee type of thing. There's really no death. Death is an illusion. Death is something that we choose to believe in, right? And everybody else is into this except our main dude here. And he's like, this is bullshit. Like what? What do you mean? And 
it's a recruitment into this cult he's starting to figure out, but it still seems innocuous. It still seems like, okay, well, maybe they're just a bunch of weirdos, Hollywood weirdos that think if they meditate, they'll not be subject to death. But then it gets weirder because now we're starting to realize, oh, actually, some of these people might be willing to die. And so we have a huge fight over dinner and someone gets shot. And then Boomer Todd Packer man goes on a rampage and it starts getting crazier. And then it turns into a giant <laughs> murder cult fest. And basically, long story short, everybody ends up dead. Uh, except for the main dude and his girlfriend, I think. I think they make it. And spoiler alert. <clears throat> The cult, when it was their murder time, went outside to light a lantern that would burn red. And so I think Todd Packer or somebody like, lights the lantern right after everybody's been killed except for the main guy, the, our hero guy survives. And then he walks out, spoiler alert, and he sees all over the Hollywood Hills and all through the city Everyone is lighting up their red sacrifice lamps, <laughs> right? So, uh, excellent, excellent twist, you know, pulling the twist the perfect way it could be pulled. And I really like the, 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 the believability of this cult and it's turning into this kind of a purge scenario, right? By the way, if you remember in the purge, it's actually a satanic cult too. The first purge, right? So, highly recommend, if you've not seen The Invitation, go watch The Invitation. Great cult movie. Number one on my top ten obscure cult movies. Let's get to the Super Chats. If you want to support the show, you can do so via Super Chats using the Streamlabs function. Storm the Cat says for $5. I've talked to Roman Catholics, and it seems like they view religion as politics. Yes, many Roman Catholics, not all, but many of them do uh, very much political activism and political action. Not many, they don't really talk about theology. Yeah, I mean, you can find, uh, you know, Roman Catholic people that are into to theology. Be that, that's kind of what the papacy chose to do a thousand years ago, was to, to care more about more. That's why you have, for example, people who are allowed to be uniates have orthodox theology, basically, and just submit to the Pope. So to me, that suggests, yeah, the papacy as an institution is more interested in geopolitical power than true theology. Pay piggy alms, $10. Here are some pay piggy alms in preparation for Lent. Thank you very much. Uh, so I had mul multiple people uh, reaching out saying, who, debate so-and-so, debate so-and-so. Uh, I will be taking a fast from debates during Lent. The only exception I would make to that is if someone wants to debate me on geopolitics, but no one will. Uh, but I will not be doing theological debates probably from now throughout Lent. So maybe fasting from that and uh, trying to uh, get better at not being so mean. Just I'm just so mean. Angry person. And no, I was not instructed to do that. Uh, I'm just doing it because uh, it's, is it a temptation to debate? Not really. I like a lot, a lot of, a lot of people probably think that I love to debate. Not really. They think that I'm just this contentious person. Not really. Uh, I will do it because I think sometimes it's necessary to do it, you know, to argue against the atheist or the Muslim position or whatever. Uh, but no, I don't actually have this huge hankering to debate all the time. In fact, I'd rather be joking around and making silly movie streams than having contentious argumentation with people. So that's actually the real me. But I will do a debate if I feel like it's, it can be beneficial and helpful. Uh, the Palantir, $3. Jay, will you ever make a Chad Nerd Philosophy ASMR video? Isn't that every video? I feel like that's basically every video. So uh, where have you been? We already do that. This can be... Premium subscriber content. Jokes aside, thank you for today's stream. Oh, so he was joking. 
Palantir, $1. Is the Doors a CIA creation? I want to go so far as to say a CIA creation, but it does seem to be the case that the figure of Jim Morrison is kind of a, a crafted to a degree persona. Because you look at young Jim Morrison, and he's like a nerdy economics student or something. Like he dresses all preppy. And then suddenly he's this, you know, bohemian wandering beach dude, uh, tripping acid and talking about insane poetry about snakes and stuff. I, so if you read Dave McGowan's book, uh, I would say that there's a mix of culture creation. I think he also says that the wrecking crew actually did the music on some of the doors songs, something like that. And I think supposedly they didn't, they, I don't know that that's what's in McGowan's book. So probably some uh, mix of that. Nekeferos, $5. Do you have any philosophy of history book recommendations? Hmm. Uh, the book of Daniel <laughs> philosophy of history book. Uh, well, Stan Eloy has a philosophy of time that's really good in volume one of orthodox dogmatics philosophy of history rush Dooney has a philosophy of history but i, I don't really, really want to recommend rush Dooney. Uh, i read his rush Dooney has a book on the book of daniel which is a philosophy of history it's not bad but i mean his theology is just so goofy it's hard for me to recommend rush Dooney. um i mean you can derive insights from spangler or something like that um, yeah, that's a good question. I just, I just don't know a good philosophy of history book. Kazi, $10. You may be interested in Larry Cohen's 1970s film, God Told Me To. Oh, I think I've seen that. It's literally a process church manifesto. Oh, I didn't know that. Let's see if, let's see if that's the movie I'm thinking. Of. I think I've seen that. God told me to. uh, does that have like the weird blonde headed looking alien Jesus character? If it does, then I have seen that. Uh, let's see. God told me to trailer. Let's see. Uh, yes. Yes. I have seen this. I did not know this had anything to do with the process church though. See, we have the best listeners. Our audience is like an, uh, the audience is a living encyclopedia here. I mean, literally the Chad nerds are the smartest people on the internet. This audience is just amazes me. Yes, I've seen this. It's a pretty funny B movie. Uh, I did, but I did not know it had any, Process Church Connections. Does it show like the... Let's see, you said... It's literally a Process Church manifesto. There's an 80s remake, I the Jury. And it was programmed to kill before Dave McGowan. Now see, this is what I, what I like. I love these obscure... I the Jury, never heard of this. These obscure references are the best. Uh, I want somebody uh, emailed me years ago, like three years ago, a giant list of B movies. I still have it printed out. And I wonder if that wasn't Martin Scorsese that emailed me because it was like somebody who's a super film buff. They were talking all about Martin Scorsese movies. And it happened to be in the list of their favorites, like some of the movies that Martin Scorsese lists us. I don't know who it was, but let's see what this is. If you're that person, uh, you know, email me again. That was a great list of B movies, which many of which we've watched, but I, the jury, <laughs> what the heck? This looks like a good fun B movie. And what is this about? This is the process church. Private detective recognizes his friend with whom he fought, blah, blah, blah. Oh, interesting. Political. Car chases, brutal murders, prawn, medical spies, and political intrigue with the CIA. 
We'll have to check out Eye of the Jury. Thank you for that recommendation. Job, $13.33. Please review Martyrs. Say 20 to the... By the way, yeah, guys, I know too, this is not all of the cult movies, right? I know there's many, many more. For example, uh, The Believers. So for, there's a lot of voodoo movies that we didn't do, and we didn't do that just because we did voodoo movies years ago. We did Serpent in the Rainbow, Skeleton Key, uh, Believers, which is great. Believers is an awesome B movie. And that's it's basically a B version of Eyes Wide Shut, but with voodoo. <laughs> and and, and uh, is it Martin Sheen? If Martin Sheen is in the in the Believers. <clears throat> Oh, an angel heart with uh, Robert De Niro as the devil. But that was a lot of fun. That was a classic Jay and Jamie film analysis of our voodoo stream. If you've never seen the voodoo stream, go and watch it. We need to redo that because <clears throat> I feel like we've learned and, and, and seen a lot since Jay and, and Jamie were doing those classic voodoo movie streams in 2000 and freaking man that was what like 2015 16 by the way we were talking about cannibalism being normalized back then shout out to jamie y'all heard of jamie let's see voodoo these still hold up by the way these are good analyses Nothing ever comes up on here when you search this crap. Stupid ass thing doesn't work. Why am I getting Michael Lofton? I want our voodoo movie analysis and I get Michael Lofton coming up. But look, I guarantee if I go, let's see, if I go in the studio and I search it I mean they, they basically have ruined their own platform it makes it makes no sense okay here we go voodoo voodoo Hollywood Hollywood voodoo and voodoo Hollywood two different movie streams that we did 2016 check this out hey, yeah that's all in my notes as we progress through the okay the movie <laughs> 2016 I found it so if you're not seen this one it's a good show we did many years ago and this is where we covered but that's the way they're um, portraying it I don't think anybody who's the movies that I listed which are kind of voodoo classics oh I forgot live and let die that's it's a bond movie but it's also a voodoo movie so we cover believers serpent of the rainbow angel heart skeleton key and live and let die in this Jay and Jamie classic go watch that it's a fun one. And then I did one with Opperman, I think. Anyway, but the Believers. Oh, we did Believers on another stream. But it uh, it also fits into that because it's a... Believers is a good one with Martin Sheen. If you're looking for <clears throat> good occult B-movies. Please review Martyrs, two thousand and eight. Seems this that sounds familiar. Let's see, Martyrs, two thousand eight. Uh, it looks pretty gory. I don't. I can't do like super gory movies, but maybe if it's not that gory. Nakafer is five dollars. Can you do the? Can you do the Southern Jews? Sentence in a cult leader, a cult leader. Uh, son, uh, you must have been raised in a poor family. Son, you must have had a poor upbringing. And, and, and I speak here not in the sense of monetary gain, but poor in the sense of moral uh, uh, quality. Poor moral quality in your elders and forebears, son, because you have created for yourself uh, 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 a cauldron of molasses forever gonna burn you in hell son and so i'm gonna send you to uh, the georgia detention center 
for 45 years, son. Hopefully to see your repentance. How's that? Palantir, $1. Random question. Do you play chess? Uh, I'm not very good at chess. Actually, Jamie is pretty good. Do you have a favorite opening? Uh, I don't. How do you feel about the London system? I am not a, a chess person. So you might think that because I like geopolitics and strategies or whatever, that I would be some sort of chess wizard man, secret chess. But no, I'm actually, I suck at chess. Uh, I think it's fun to play, but I have not put a whole lot of time and effort into being good at chess. Constantine. Minotram, Minotarma, five dollars. What do you think of Carl Schmidt? I get asked this a lot. I have not, I'm not well read in either Heidegger or Carl Schmidt. Can it be used to advance orthodoxy? Uh, typically, I don't think uh, German philosophy is that helpful to orthodoxy personally, but I'm also not uh, very well studied in uh, a lot of those post Kantian uh, German philosophers. So, I mean, I've had a, a Hegel class. Uh, I read a little bit of uh, Schopenhauer, um, but I'm not very well versed in those guys. I had a class on Heidegger, but I get asked that a lot. Jack Parsons, would you recommend a natural theology book in Orthodoxy by Bradshaw and Swinburne? I mean, I think that book is a little misleading in the title because everybody just buy it says, oh, look, uh, we believe in natural theology because the book says natural theology and it has David Bradshaw's uh, uh, name on the cover. Okay, but there's a chapter later on that has four pages of Greek, modern, orthodox, and Greek theologians that reject natural theology. So the book is good for that section, pointing out the problems. And Dr. Bradshaw's chapter uh, is real, isn't really about the issue of natural theology itself. It's just arguing that prior to Kant in the Orthodox tradition, people made classical types of arguments. Okay. So what? Um, again, and even in Bradshaw's chapter, he says, however, towards the end of his chapter, he says, however, none of what I'm saying is a response to, or a rejoinder to any of the kinds of critiques that we would see in Hume and Kant. So the point is not that you can't make an argument about metaphysics or causation or telos. The point is that if the opponents that we're interacting with are post-human Kant, most of the modern world is operating from that paradigm. So we need something that's going to address, that's going to address critiques from the post-Hume Kant paradigm. And if pre-Hume Kant arguments don't address that, they're not very useful. They're only as useful as the people sh that share those metaphysical presuppositions. Okay, well, post-human Kant, the modern world doesn't share our metaphysical presuppositions and worldview. So, TAG is very useful for that. Tyra, $10. I enjoy your show's exploring films. I've discovered a lot of gems through these. Hey, thank you, me too. Actually, we do. We do the same thing. We actually get recommendations all the time. Um, so let's say I've written down like three, right? I, the jury, martyrs to check out. And I th think there was one more, but I forgot what it was. Uh, anyway. But yeah, me too. J Mel, 60 bucks. Win in the night for Super Chats. Big old fat 60 bucks says, thank you for a great hangout. Thank you. Guys, if you would hit like and share. We've had a lot of fun tonight. Uh, Jamie couldn't join me, but she will be bright and bushy-tailed next time. Serena, $20. I can attest to the fact that the chocolate does work. The energy is there. I had it officially joined what I call the, the smoothie cult, the smoothinati. However, I really do love this stuff. Silent Hill is good, and it's cool to hear your breakdown. The pyramid head guy always freaked me out. Yeah, I forgot to mention that um, basically the 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 movie end. Well, just go watch it. I don't want to spoil uh, Silent Hill because it's got a good ending that I don't want to spoil. So we'll, we'll leave it at that. Mitch82, $10. Can you recommend a good book on Byzantine Christianity? I'm frustrated with Catholics after Vatican II. Sure. So if you're a Roman Catholic, I would say start with uh, Mystical Theology of the Eastern Church by Lasky as a good introduction. 
I would get Nicholas Cabasilas' uh, uh, Life in Christ. I would get uh, St. Justin Popovich's book, Orthodox Faith and Life in Christ, because it has uh, critiques of Renaissance papacy and basically presents Byzantine Christology. Um, I would get Church Papacy Schism by uh, Dr. Sherard. This is a philosophical critique of the metaphysics of the papacy and the filioque and an argument for <clears throat> orthodox metaphysics based on no filioque and the essence energy distinction. I would read Aristotle East and West by Dr. David Bradshaw. Uh, there's a lot more, but I would start with those. The Palantir $1. A little while back, you were joking about ASMR microphone in a stream you did. Yes. I was joking about... ASMR things in a stream. Thank you, Palantir. <laughs> you are correct. I did do that. Uh, all right. A lot of fun tonight, guys. If you would, hit like and share. Um, what's next? Next up is part two for subscribers of our Vatican things. Paul Williams, Gladio, and Spies in the Vatican. I'll be done with the, both of these books soon. And uh, <clears throat> delineating who's right in terms of the assassination attempt at John Paul II. Right? We've already decoded that this was a total CIA Cold War symbolism. But between these two authors, who, by the way, the reason we're, we're reading two, two sides of the Cold War, cri critical of the West pro neocon cold war guy right here is that between the two of these, we get a lot of confirmation for intelligence infiltrating using religion. But what we want to know is, Hey, wait a minute. Now there's this contention between the two. Was it the KGB behind the assassination of John Paul II, or was it the CIA using it as a stage situation to make John Paul II a martyr to make the, commies look bad could be either one and by the way i don't think either of these sides are good guys they're both bad guys unfortunately not saying all the catholics are bad people but i'm saying that it's more complex than that and so we're going to look at the recent uh phd thesis from i guess dr ganser i'm assuming he got his thesis phd for this uh, NATO secret armies by Ganser. And I think I already kind of proved my case in the first few minutes with, okay, I'm not going to believe as credible any entity that is touting itself as the reality of Marvel movies to my NATO. There, the, yes, that's a real tweet. I kid you not. Okay, so I guess I'm already, that's already telling me that probably Dr. Ganser is correct that <laughs> it was the CIA using the wolves, the gray wolf. Have you heard of the gray wolves? So this is a uh, Turkish organized crime hit squad that Ali Agka comes out of. So as I understand it, that's not itself contentious what's contentious is who put ali agka up to it so william says the ca engineered that to make john paul ii into the cold war martyr symbol kohler says no that was a disinformation campaign by marcus wolf of the stasi so we're going to look at ganser and see what his thesis is who was really Organizing that attempted assassination, and it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. If you would hit like and share, 